Good morning, friends, and welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, April 24th. This is the second Sunday of our Easter season this year. In spite of all that we've heard and all that we've seen, it's often hard to believe. And because it's so hard to believe, we will invest ourselves in the Easter mystery for 50 days, which is a week of weeks. Because it's hard to believe, John the Evangelist will provide sign after sign celebrating Jesus' victory over death. Because it's hard to believe, the Lord Jesus will return to us again and again in the mystery of our Holy Communion, inviting us to touch and taste his presence and offering us his peace. I pray that you're blessed as you join us in our worship service this morning. And we begin our worship service today as we give thanks for the gift of baptism. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery and for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for your river of life flowing freely from your throne through the earth, through the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters, you flood us with mercy and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gate of righteousness and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water once again. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, Wipe away our every tear. To you, our beginning and end, our shepherd and lamb, be honor, glory, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please join me in the prayer of the day. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The first reading assigned for this second Sunday of Easter is from Acts, the fifth chapter. We're going to be reading verses 27 to 32, but to put it in context, I wanted to kind of explain where we're at. Following Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter and the other apostles are filled with the power of the Spirit, and they go out and they're preaching in the temple. And as they do, many are brought to them that are sick, and the power of the Spirit allows them to heal many of those who are sick. Finally, the priests and the Sadducees have had enough of this, and they send out the police, the temple police, and have them arrested and put in prison. During the night, God sends a miraculous power that releases them from prison. And instead of going into hiding and, and laying low, as you might expect them to do, they go out right away again, right back to the temple and start their preaching and healing again. So the, the temple priests and, and the Sadducees, they, they've had enough and they have them arrested once again and they bring them in for questioning. And that's where we pick up in our story. Again, it's Acts 5, verses 27 to 32. When they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God, rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm assigned for this morning is Psalm 150. Hallelujah. Praise God in the holy temple. Praise God in the mighty firmament. Praise God for mighty acts. Praise God for exceeding greatness. Praise God with trumpet sound. Praise God with lyre and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with resounding cymbals. Praise God with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Here ends our reading from the Psalms. Our second reading assigned for today is from the book of Revelation. We'll read from the first chapter, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we prepare our hearts for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Our Gospel this morning tells us of the events that took place a little later on that first Easter day. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, 
and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So friends, I, I don't know what your traditions are on Easter, but mine includes overeating after church and then slouching in a comfortable chair all afternoon. And, and then we typically eat up all the leftovers before dozing off in front of some trivial movie on the TV during that evening. This year, we watched a movie called Don't Look Up, which was written as a political satire on our world's divisiveness and apathy around the climate change issue. And this movie, it's, well, it's quite controversial. And how could it not be when its main assumption is that our world's downright contrarian mindset is leading to the death of our planet? And, and please don't take me wrong here. I'm not advocating the specific politics of this movie, and I'm not encouraging folks to run on out and watch it. I'm just saying that there's something in there that they get right. They use the idea of this huge comet that's on a collision course with the Earth, a, a, a course that assures an extinction event as a metaphor for climate change. And the scientists, they see the comet's approach while there's still time to do something about it, but it all too quickly becomes overly politicized. And some deny that that comet is out there at all, and others draw up plans to capitalize on the mineral wealth that they believe is locked in the comet. And others still, they just trivialize the event until it's too late to do anything to escape the impact that will destroy all life on the Earth. At first, everyone's arguing about whether the comet actually exists at all. I mean, it's too far away to see, so to believe, you'd have to trust the scientists. And it's pretty easy to get people not to trust scientists if you put your mind to it. So the world splits into those who believe and those who don't, until the day comes when the comet is just so close that you can just look up and see the comet with your bare eyes. And that's when this idea of just look up takes hold. Those who believe the comet is coming are crying out, just look up, because if you do, you can't miss the truth. But others reflexively take up the cry, don't look up, whatever you do, don't look up, just keep looking down, just keep placing one foot in front of the other and hats and shirts are made and they have the opposing slogans on them and all the while that comet is getting closer and closer and programs that might have stopped it, they stall out or are abandoned for some supposed profit motive 
until people can no longer avert their eyes and they see the comet for themselves and they can't deny the inevitable, but now it's too late. And that's what seems real to me. We are a world that would just as soon focus on our own partisan political agendas and preferred catchphrases and media personalities and heroes rather than reaching for the simple truth. We expend more energy trying to diminish and demonize those on the other side and defending the sanctity of our own pride than we put into finding the objective truth. And because we do, we risk not seeing that which is real and true and healing and life-giving. You know, there must be something to this divide and demonize thing that we've got going on here that's, that's feeding something in our souls. Maybe it's just more fun to fight among ourselves than it is to care for each other. Maybe once we've tasted the adrenaline rush from hating those on the other side and really, really loving those on our own side, maybe after that it's just too hard to give it up. I don't know. On that first Easter morning, the women went out looking for Jesus' tomb. And when they saw that it was empty, they rushed back and told the other apostles who were still locked in that upper room. And when the men heard what the women said, uh, they thought it was an idle tale. It's impossible. Why bother looking for yourselves? Don't bother getting out of your comfy chair. Don't look up. But Peter and another disciple, they went. They went and they saw that it was just as the women had said. The stone was rolled away. And they decided to take an even deeper look. They, they saw the grave clothes in that empty tomb folded and, and placed aside. And they went back and they told the others. And these others, they were amazed to hear it. They were so amazed that they apparently chose not to bother to go look for themselves. They just nestled in and pondered this strange story. And today I have this image in my mind of Peter and the other disciple and those women as waving the banner of just look for yourselves while the rest were wearing t-shirts that say, whatever you do, don't look in the tomb. But later that evening, while they were still arguing about it, Jesus came right into the room, locked door or not, and he showed himself to them and they were stunned. How could you deny what your own eyes saw and your ears heard and your hands touched? It was Jesus alive again, and now they believed. Except for Thomas, who wasn't there when Jesus came. But when Thomas came back, the whole room was filled with these just believe types. And Thomas said, well, uh, no way. You may be, what, hypnotized or hysterical or, or just plain wrong. I won't believe until I see for myself, until I touch him, dig my fingers into his wounds and prove to myself that it's really him. And a week later, that's exactly what happened. Jesus came back to them and he pulled Thomas aside and said, just look up, look in, look at me, touch me, prod me, poke me, do what you must, but give up the denial. See the reality. Don't let your predisposition to believe only those things that you've seen before keep you from accepting that which is truly unique and wonderful that God's doing right now, right here for the very first time. And Thomas, he sank to his knees and he claimed Christ as not only risen from the dead, but also as his own Lord and God. And Jesus said, Thomas, have you believed because you've seen? Well, that's all fine and good. But blessed are those who have never seen and never will see with their own eyes in this realm and yet believe. Blessed are those who will never have the chance to examine the physical evidence, to touch my wounds or to scan my DNA, and yet will believe the words of your testimony. Blessed are they who believe even before they can see it with their own eyes. And friends, that's us. 
generations and generations of us who have heard the word proclaimed through scripture and prophets and preachers and teachers and evangelists and, and friends and come to believe. Believe that Jesus didn't just die and crumble into dust, but that he rose again. And we believe not just in order to be contrary with our enlightened society. We believe because we think there's something that we can still see if we're willing to just look up. We think that we can still see the evidence of Jesus' resurrection lingering in the words of Scripture and in our own atmosphere. We still see him reaching out to us in our everyday life as he comforts, encourages, lifts, and guides us. We still see him if we'll just stop denying and allow ourselves to look up. And the prophet John, he certainly believed that as well. He says, look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. John cries out for us to look. He wants us to use our eyes, our brains, our education, our intuition, our instincts, and to be open. He wants us to refuse to close our minds to the things that, well, we find simply too uncomfortable to hear or believe. He wants us not to get so entrenched in any human party, school, cult, movement, or camp that we can't think for ourselves and we end up closing ourselves off from the truth that brings life to us even in this life, life upon life. Depth upon depth, the peace and comfort and eternal security of knowing that we at least looked up and gave ourselves the opportunity to see the one who came to us once so long ago and rose from the dead just as he promised he would. See him coming to us in this life, in his word and in the gift of his body and blood and in a hundred different ways in our daily lives. And we who listened to John were called to keep looking up, keep looking to the clouds. For the promise is that he not only rose that one time so long ago, but that he will also come again one day, returning in glory. And all eyes will see him, whether they've been too lazy to look up or too proud or afraid or too skeptical to be open, even if they caught glimpses of him in the past. John says that all eyes will see him one day and will know the joy then that they might have had every day of their lives if they'd only looked up a little bit sooner and embraced the grace of his impossible presence and the promises that he embodies and brings to us and through us to our neighbors and our children and our world for ages and ages to come. Amen.
And now our worship continues as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, all people in need, and all of creation. Holy One who acts righteously, equip your church as witnesses of your goodness to go and tell others of your abundant love, that they may believe that Jesus is our salvation and life. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew your people's commitment to use resources responsibly and to live well with your creation. Invite us to recognize and nurture signs of resurrection life in the natural world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Direct those who are given human authority to lead with humility and compassion. By your Holy Spirit, channel their attention toward serving those who are most in need. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uphold your children who cry out to you. Especially this morning, we lift to you Jacob, Fatima, Pamela, Grace, Myrtle, Marianne, Ron, Cheryl, Carol, Marie, Jim, Denny, Cecilia, Kim, Inez, Brody, and John. Along with these, we lift you all who live or work at the Samaritas Lodge, woods, or terraces. Wherever people are overcome by the fear of death, breathe into them your life and your peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Inspire those who lead your people in worship and praise. This morning, we especially raise to you Sharon and Jess, Stephan, Ryan and Matt, and each and every one who volunteers to serve as greeters, ushers, communion assistants, lectors, to provide coffee and refreshments, or play in the bell choir, or care for the altar. With joyful motion and sound, send us forth with praise that we cannot keep to ourselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us the words of your saints who, like Thomas, boldly confessed your Son as Lord and God. With Jesus, our leader, empower us to live according to his ways. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always.
Please join me in the offertory prayer. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us and show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Rejoicing in our risen Lord, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, for in your word and presence we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we receive the blessing. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go in peace. Tell what God has done. Thanks be to God.